Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Alex Walker, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Catholic Medical Center in Manchester, New Hampshire. Alex took an unusual route to senior leadership in the healthcare field. Prior to joining Catholic Medical Center in 2012, he spent more than 20 years practicing corporate law and litigation at one of New Hampshire's largest and most prestigious law firms. In the podcast, we talk about Alex's journey from his early experiences in the Marine Corps to what it was like to rise to become president of Divine and Millimet, and ultimately his decision to change careers and industries and join the team at Catholic Medical Center. What I thought was especially interesting about Alex's story was how he described the experience of joining a mission-driven, nonprofit hospital and how important that was to him. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And if you do enjoy the podcast, won't you please leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Alex Walker. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Hello, Mark. Happy to be here. So we want to start with kind of your career journey. Um, and, uh, and I understand you were a, a Marine. Was that straight out of high school or... It was. I, I, I enlisted in the Marine Corps when I was uh, 17. I was a senior in high school. I had to have my, uh, my parents sign off on the enlistment, and they, they, they both cried. Mm. And I, le- I left for Paris Island about three weeks after I graduated uh, from high school. And what drew you to the Marines? That's a big, I mean, that's a big decision for a young man. Yeah. To I, you know, it, I look back and... People ask me that question. My kids have asked me that question. And I think it was, uh, like a lot of things in life, it was a combination of blind luck, kind of intuition, and just a little bit of kind of seeing the future. And, you know, I was, uh, I was, a, I was an uneven student in high school. Okay. I liked school. I loved what I loved. So I used to, I, I, you know, my dream job. I wanted to be a sports writer for the Boston Globe. Oh, nice. and I loved journalism and I loved, I wanted to be a newspaper reporter and I loved seeing those people and it just, it was, and I was an editor of my high school newspaper and I wrote for the, the, the local town newspaper and just, but I was, I was not ready for college. Okay. And I knew that. And you knew I, said, that. I knew that. And I knew I just, I was going to squander an opportunity and I didn't have the resources, you know, my parents didn't have the resources to, so I was going to be on my own for college. And I just said, you know, it's just going to not going to be good. So like, how do I, how do I become more mature? How do Mm -hmm. I, how do I prepare myself? And what, believe me, it sounds like it was a very analytical process. (laughs) It wasn't at the time. It was just like blind luck. And, but intuitively I knew this wasn't going to be a good experience and or end well if I went straight from high school to college. And then as I thought about the things that kind of I like, like, like with journalists, you know, you see them on TV, you read books, you're like, ah, oh, that guy's cool. I like the way that person's doing this. I, I think I like that profession. The Marine Corps had the same kind of appeal to me. Sure. It's like the culture. I like the fact that they're like badasses. Yeah. I, 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 I love the uniform. I love the kind of the culture and the mystique around what the Marine Corps embodied. And, and, it was, and there was a competitive aspect to it. So I like that. I'm like, I, you know, I bet you I bet you I could do that. I like to think I could do that. I think it would be good for me. I think I would grow up. It would be a great experience. And, you know, it's only three years, so... What the heck? Yeah, and so, so I did it. So, what were you? Uh, what was your specialty in the Marine? I mean, everybody's a rifleman first, but did you? Right. Have, yes. Did you have a specialty as well? I did. Or were you well, so so called. Yeah. So I went from um, I was so I went to boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina, traditional Marine Corps boot camp for people east of the Mississippi, and then I, and then I went to communication school. So I was a radio operator. 
And so radio operator in the Marine Corps is essentially just, you're, you're, you're an infantryman, <laughs> but you carry a big heavy radio on your back, yeah. and you're the first guy they shoot. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the life the expectancy one. of a radio man in an, in an infantry uh-huh. um, uh, uh, platoon is very short. Yeah. And so, uh, so I went to 29 Palms, California for that training. And... And that was uh, several months. And um, so when I got done with that, I finished. Uh, so I finished first in my class. And so I got to pick where I went for my next duty station, which was unbelievable. Yeah. So I got to, you know, That's and I neat. had a whole wow. array of choices, uh, East Coast, West Coast, Air Wing, Infantry. And I ended up choosing uh, Camp Pendleton. Okay. Uh, in in Southern California, mostly because you know I'd never spent any time on the West Coast. I was in California, in the desert. Twenty Nine Palms is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Camp Pendleton is as you know as beautiful a spot as you're going to find in the country. It's in you know Southern Orange County, Northern San Diego County, right on the right on the Pacific Ocean. Big huge base. You know, home of the First Marine Division. Uh, you know, I was you know eighteen years old, and I said, yeah. you know, this sounds really cool. Yeah. And so, so that's where I went, and I was attached. So I got there, and I was attached to a, not to an infantry unit, but to an artillery battalion. And so, so I worked with, you know, f- you know, fire direction control and forward observers, and um, so we did a lot of you know, we just we were out in the desert all the time. We did training with the Navy SEALs down at Coronado Island. We did winter training up in the Sierras. It was, it was cool. It was just a very cool experience. Yeah. And worked with, you know, people from, from all walks of life. Right. So, you know, I had I had, guys that were in my unit that were you know former East LA gangbangers. I had people that, you know, second lieutenants that had gone to the Naval Academy, I had one that had gone to, you know, Harvard, people, you know, rednecks from, you know, Wyoming, and it was just like as big a melting pot as you could ever get, which is one of the great things, as you know, about the military. It is, yeah. And it just is just an immersion in how to live and work and play with 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 others yeah. and having real diversity, real diversity, yeah. and you know, and and you know, you get to see kind of the good and the bad and the ugly in people and stereotypes, right? So I was from, you know, I grew up in the Boston area, and so yeah, you know, I was the I was the guy from Boston with the accent, <laughs> right, right, and, and not that they had didn't, didn't have any accents, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> and yeah. uh, so, but 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 you know, this is now, you know, the early 1980s, and so you know. Being from Boston didn't have great connotations for lots of folks. You know, we, you know, just a few years removed from force busing in the city and all of the mm-hmm. racial tension and all of that. And so, you know, being from Boston kind of carried a little bit of that baggage. So it was just, and so how, you know, navigating um, all of that while doing it in a in a Marine Corps unit that prided itself on you know esprit de corps and teamwork and you know getting the mission done. It was just a great experience for a young kid. So you spent three years in, yes. and um, and then you got out. Yes. Uh, so no temptation to stay? And, and uh, they, yeah, no, lots they... of temptation to stay. I, I thought about it uh, long and hard. I had some opportunity to, to, to go to college, so I, I had an opportunity to do a, uh, one of my commanding officers was a, a, an alum of Texas A&M, and so he helped me with an opportunity to, uh, to go to A&M. To con- in, but to stay connected and to go through the R- ROTC program and then to come out the other side with a with a commission and thought about that thought about you know becoming a you know reenlisting for another few years and becoming a drill instructor mm-hmm. it was just that piece was kind of alluring to me but in the end I was like you know I want to go to college I kind of went in knowing knowing I was going to go to college wanted to be back on the East Coast, and uh, and at the time I met, so I met my wife, who is from Los Angeles, when I was out there. So when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, we met, started dating, and uh, she, she's a, a Navy brat, and so there's no way she was gonna 
stick with this relationship if I stayed in the military. Oh, she, she loved she'd the had military, enough. but she's not doing <laughs> Her dad did it, and they moved all over the country. She wasn't okay. doing that again. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, long story yeah. short. None of my I, kids had any interest in doing military. So. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I just said, you know what? It was, this has been a great three years. Yeah. Loved it. But it's time to kind of move on. So you felt like you'd grown up, that goal of going yes. in? Yeah. 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 And yeah. then, so came back and went to UMass Boston. Yes. So what was the draw to UMass Boston? And then you majored in, you, you double majored in English and yeah. political science. We were yeah. kind so, of joking so, about before. So, you know, this is just like, you think back on in your life and the decisions you make. And like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I loved UMass. UMass Boston was great. But the reason I chose it because I just... I didn't. I barely. I didn't know the difference between UMass Boston and Boston College or, or or uh, UNH. Or mm-hmm. I just, sure. you know, I didn't. My parents weren't. I was the first in my family. My okay. dad had thirteen brothers and sisters. My mom ten. So we got a huge family from Somerville, Mass. And uh, nobody had ever gone to college. So nobody's there to kind of guide you. No, I had this no is... guidance. I had zero guidance, zero. And so, you know. When, with UMass Boston, I didn't have to retake the SAT. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a benefit. So it was great. So like, I'm like, wow, all right, I kind of like that. And, uh, so, and it was, uh, and it was commutable, and it was affordable, most of all. So yeah. I had, some, you know, the the Marine Corps at the time had, you know, this is like 1981, a very watered down GI Bill. You know, wasn't what it had been, and it wasn't. It was probably in the in the arc of kind of the GI Bill. It was at its lowest point ever. It's come back and there's more, it's oh, more robust, yeah. I think, than it's it very ever generous now, yeah. has been. But it was it was a disaster then, and so I had saved some money while I was in the Marine Corps, but I had only um, I could barely swing a state public university, and I wasn't about to go to Amherst. Yeah, that was too far. That too was far. Uh, uh-huh. I, I might as well be, you know, out in in in. in well, it's you know, west upstate. of Worcester, so exactly. Like, it's just like you fall off the side yeah, of the. Yeah, right? well, for me anyway, my <laughs> worldview is once you get east of Waltham, so it was one twenty eight. <laughs> you get out Worcester, that's way past four ninety five. Yeah, that's who wants to be out there? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so so I went to UMass Boston. I was a little bit older, and they had a non traditional student body, and there were more vets there than. I think at, at other places, and and I, you know, I loved it. I loved being back, you know, in a classroom. I loved kind of learning. Always, like I said, I always, I always loved to write and uh, loved to read. And then the politics. So remember, this is now 1984. I got out of the Marine Corps in the summer of '84, and Ronald Reagan was president. Mm-hmm. I was a big fan of Ronald Reagan. I was, I was not only the first person in my college to go to. First person in my family to go to college. I was the first person in my family to register Republican. Oh my! Uh, <laughs> so you were still allowed to come home for, well, for holidays. So or? my grand, so my grandmother, God rest her soul, her favorite person on the planet was Rose Kennedy, and she was as and and she you know, born and raised in Somerville and just a huge Tip O'Neill fan. And so my family very very strong. Democrats, but I took a different path. So, but they still, they yeah. still let me back. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you wound up with this kind of writing-oriented course of studies. Yeah. And then graduated, and did you go straight to law school? Because that was I, your ultimate. I did. Yeah. And I so I, you know, I kind of knew pretty early on. I, you know, I kind of gave up my dreams of becoming a newspaper reporter, or a yeah. sports writer. I said you can't really earn a living. Uh-huh. So I'm like, you know, I like. I liked, I liked to write. I knew lawyers did a lot of writing. I liked being on my feet and talking and jousting and arguing. And so I was like, I think I'd like to be a litigator. Yeah. And it was part of the same, you know, it's competitive. There's very few things more engaging in life than trying a case in a courtroom in front of a jury and or standing there with five justices of the you know supreme, supreme. court asking you questions it yeah. is just as engaging a process as, as you could ever hope to have so i said i think this i think law schools and i can make a living yeah. and i can pay my student loans and i can you know yeah. 
start a family and all that. So, so that's uh, so that's what I did. So you went to Northeastern for I did. law school. How'd you pick Northeastern? So yes. at that point, did you have some guidance, or was there... I had a little more guidance? <laughs> I had a little more guidance at that stage. I had some great mentors at at, at UMass Boston. I spent the last year there, so I was I, I was the uh, elected student trustee for the campus, wow. and so that was uh, it's my one and only uh, run for political office. So I'm one for one. And uh, so I had a, so I had exposure to a whole host of people. So working on the you know with the UMass Board of Trustees, I met some really cool people, including a guy named Larry DeCara, who prominent lawyer in Boston and big into politics and just a great guy, and a bunch of other people who kind of guided me along. And um, so so Northeastern, you know, the co-op program at Northeastern was very appealing to me to get some real world experience. Um, and that applies in the law school as well? Dave? It does, yeah. So I did some really cool co-ops. You can do four of them. So it's a three-year program like every other law school, and you do a traditional first year. And then immediately after your f- first year finals, the class splits in half. And one half stays in class, uh, and the other half goes on a co-op. And then every three months, you flip-flop for the next two years. And so you get f- essentially four, four co-ops, so a full year's worth of, of kind of on-the-job training. Uh, and, the, and the co-op jobs are highly competitive, and they're all over the country. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, so my, I did a, my co-ops included working for the Mass Teachers Union. Uh, that was my first one, so it, and that was uh, really interesting and fun. And then I did a, a co-op at the firm I ultimately went to work for when I got out of law school, Divine Millimet. So that was a traditional kind of summer associate job. And then I did a I did a co-op with a federal judge, and so I clerked for a federal judge in in Boston. And, and then I did a co-op in Los Angeles. So when I had a job secured at Divine Millimet, okay. the last one I said, oh, I got one to burn. So what would be cool to do? So. I went and worked for an entertainment law firm in in Century City. Oh wow! And, uh, yeah, firm that represented you know that Roseanne Barr and Michael Jackson, and it was it was a super cool experience. And my my wife was a year behind me in law school, so okay. we got married after I left the Marine Corps, and she finished her undergrad work in California, and moved to we moved to Somerville, and grew up you know we moved into three decker that my my dad still owned, and we the newlyweds. In the house I grew up in, and uh, my grandmother lived on the first floor, my aunt and uncle on the second floor, and uh, my wife and I took the third floor apartment. Very nice. And lived there for eight years while, while I went to college and in law school. My wife went; to, she was a year behind me at Northeastern. Oh wow! Okay. And so she did a job. Uh, she did her co-op at the Riverside County District Attorney's Office while I was working in in Century City. Sounds like you might have had more fun. I had a much <laughs> more interesting experience yeah. and a better commute. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, okay. it was uh, so that was uh, so that was my law school experience. It was yeah. great, and you know, so by that time, you know, it's the early 1990s. I was a little bit older, so I was four years older than. So I was feeling like I mean, time to get settled in and start a family. And so we thought about where we were gonna, where were we gonna live, and where we were gonna raise our family. And um, you know, Divine Millimet. You know, I spent a summer there. They, you know, sent me an offer to come back, and um, I never thought I'd end up in New Hampshire. And well, we just liked, we liked New Hampshire. We liked Manchester. Just saw it as a great place to raise a family mm-hmm. and to settle down and develop roots. And you know, we thought about going back to the West Coast. We thought about staying in Boston, but uh, just that in the end, we just said, you know, I'd like to be in a community where. We, uh, you know, we can really kind of settle in, not have a big commute to work, and kind of meld our personal and professional lives in a way that you really don't get when, you know, you're commuting an hour into into right. work. Right. Yeah. So that that was really the draw. Yeah. So. Divine Millimet, tell, tell a little bit about the firm. Yeah. Uh, when you joined and kind of what what I don't know that much about law firms. So yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, how would you describe so I would practice. say, so Divine Millimet, you know, then and now is, you know, one of the uh, largest law firms in the state for many, many years. And still there are probably th- 
three law firms in the state that vie for being, you know, the top law firm. You get Divine Millimet, she and Finney, the McLean firm, all had kind of at different points in time the, the, the most number of lawyers. And doing, and as a result, large law firm, you know, you're doing the most interesting kind of work, uh, both on the corporate side and the litigation side. And Divine Millimet had a very rich history and legacy with partners that had worked there that had gone on to serve on the federal bench, state supreme court, involved in public life, and and just a rich history of being a, a firm full of uh, kind of the, the best trial lawyers in the state, mm-hmm. kind of top gun pilots when it comes to trying a case. All right. And so. And that's what you were interested in. I was, yeah. All, all the so, way through law school. Yes. So the initial attraction was litigation and you stuck it, with it. it. I did stick with it. I, I would not be, if I had to do corporate work or tax work or real estate law or patent, I would not be a lawyer today. I just, I, it's just not, that just didn't appeal to me at all. You know, being stuck in an office, um, just doing that stuff had no appeal to me. Oh. So, and so I was able to, when I spent the summer at the firm, I, you know, love the people and love the work ethic. It was, you know, law firms are kind of tough environments. So it's full of kind of hard charging type A kind of personalities. And I like that. And um, so, would you yeah. describe yourself as a hard charging type A? I person? don't know. I think um, I mean I think I would say I'm um, pretty driven yeah. in terms of what I very kind of goal oriented. So it's good at setting goals along the way and, and keeping my focus in terms of achieving a goal. Yeah, uh, I think that's an important uh, element of anybody that achieves some measure of success: the ability to set goals. That that gets harder as you go on in life. Right, because you know, with me, it was like, okay, so my goal is, I'm going to get into college, then I'm going to get good grades so I can get into law school, and you get into law school, then you want to get a job as a summer intern at a good firm, and so you got to get the good grades, and then you got to do well on your summer intern, then you get the offer, then you got to pass the bar, and so, but once you pass the bar, it's like you're kind of adrift because you're thinking, yeah, like what's the next? So the next thing for somebody coming out of Law school and in a big firm, you make partner. But that's seven years. Okay. And so as you're coming up, your goals as a student are every semester. Yeah. And every three months. Yeah. So to have a a long goal. Yeah. So then, so you got to recalibrate. And that's an adjustment for a lot of people. How do you keep that focus for that amount of time and not get? Is seven years a standard across the industry? Oh, it it, it was at the time. It's much longer now. I mean, the the business of law firms is so different, and it's so much harder. It's not unlike kind of tenure track positions. Well, that's exactly what's running through my head. You know, it's 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 become more and more elusive, and that was the brass ring everybody was going after. And um, and and as the business of law firms changed, as the economics changed, you had. The demographics, we have fewer and fewer equity partners, people that shared in the profits as opposed to non-equity partners that were great lawyers, but perhaps not great rainmakers. And so... And what does that mean? I mean? You know, somebody that's going to... The rainmaker in the firm is the person that brings in the business. Okay. You have to be, you know, so if you're going to be a fully formed, the most... Highly compensated people in law firms are the people that can not only bring in work to keep themselves busy, but keep other people busy and then actually be very productive. So you have some people that are very productive, very highly skilled technical lawyers, but they don't bring in an ounce and of so work. so they don't make partner. If, if they make, and they, they used they, to make partner. Yeah. They don't make partner as much anymore in the in the in the top law firms because you, you really need to be able to keep that kind of that pyramid going and churning yeah. and and um, and that just means constantly bringing in new business that not only keeps your plate full but keeps the plates of your associates and paralegals and others full. So it's a, it's a hard... So as a result, over time, that seven-year track became eight, then nine, some firms ten. Then it became a track not just 
from associate to equity partner, but associate to non-equity partner. Maybe if you maybe you came off the track a little sooner and as more and more women in the practice of law and all the challenges around work-life balance and you just see how young women starting families, like how difficult that is. Like that, and that just that's just something I marvel at to this day. It's like <laughs> how to balance all of the things that you have to when you're a professional and when you're and you have a family and that tug is it's hard it's super hard yeah and and in and in a high pressure high stress high expectation environment of a law firm it's particularly hard yeah, yeah. so you went into litigation. Yes. Was is that is there a specific like area of law that you were doing? Uh, litigation yeah. So in, I was or? a so I was a commercial litigator. So okay. And and at Divine Millimet and a lot of firms at the time, you had you know business litigation uh, as opposed to insurance defense litigation. So the firm for many years had worked for insurance companies. So defending motor vehicle accidents and slip and falls and products liability and medical malpractice and so all the things that you you know people are insured for and professionals are insured for you had lawyers that would defend those kinds of cases i wanted something a little sexier in my mind which okay. was kind of the business litigation trade secrets litigation trademark and copyright and non compete situations, companies that were blowing up and, and battling and corporate conflict. So that was the kind of stuff I wanted to be involved in. A little more complex and complicated. The trade-off there is you tried fewer cases than, you know, the people that were doing insurance defense or, pros- you know, kind of criminal prosecutors or criminal defense lawyers. But it kind of it gave my a little more intellectually stimulating mm-hmm. and, and but still lots of uh, opportunities to be in a courtroom. At what point did you become involved with health law at all? Or or did you at all? (laughs) Or was that part of the commercial process? Yeah, it was part, it was like on the, so I got, uh, so my first exposure to health law, health care, was back in the the mid-1990s when uh, Optima Healthcare here in New Hampshire and here in Manchester began to blow up. And so the merger between the Elliott Hospital and Catholic Medical Center back in the mid-90s. So just setting the stage here. So we're here in Catholic Medical Center. Yes. There's another hospital called Elliott. Yeah. They merged. Yes. And then it it didn't really work out. And it yeah, and there was a fairly quick unmerging process. Well, it was a it was a, it wasn't a fairly quick unmerging. It was a long and painful <laughs> okay. unmerging that involved lots of litigation. Okay, and so that's where I got involved. Oh, I okay, and so health and it's just it was a it was an exposure that I had. It was fascinating on a number of levels, just including like understanding the history of healthcare in the city of Manchester. And the differences in the cultures uh, within the city of Manchester. So you had Catholic Medical Center, which was you know on the west side of of the city. Elliot Hospital up on the hill, founded by Mary Elliot, who in her will declared that Elliot Hospital was being founded to provide health care for non-Catholics. Oh wow! Okay. And so so and just the. The cultural differences with folks on the west side and across the river and the mills and French Canadian and uh, it just it had all of that history Mm -hmm. and so when these organizations came together this is back in the business so you got you got HMOs and healthcare is changing pretty dramatically and everybody's not unlike what happened you know post Affordable Care Act and so the transformation of healthcare, and people thought it would be smart to bring these organizations to merge them into into one organization. And on paper, when you look at that, you say, "Yeah, I mean, you know, you have a city of a hundred thousand people. You know, would you really build a healthcare system 
in, in a city of 100,000 people with, with two hospitals offering a lot of the same services. And no, you probably wouldn't. But that doesn't take into account like the long history and cultures and traditions and Catholic and non-Catholic. And so and that all that came together, the people did it for what they thought were all the right reasons. And in the end, however, it, there wasn't enough respect paid to kind of the Catholic identity and Catholic values of Catholic Medical Center. There's lots of allegations around promises being made, about the future of Catholic Medical Center, and then once things were merged, you know, a lot of services began going across the river, and including the the license to perform open heart surgery, which was Catholic Medical Center at that time was the so-called heart hospital, and open heart surgery in the city of Manchester started here, and and that was being taken away, and CMC was on a path to essentially become a rehab hospital and all of the services were going to go across the street to the Elliott. So community groups and others got involved, and, and the attorney general got involved, and it got blown up. And so you had to, so they merged, and then they had to demerge. And so that was my first exposure. Wow. I was involved in the litigation that would bring the license to perform open heart surgery back across the river to Catholic Medical Center. And so we litigated that two years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You must have made partner at some point in... in I firm. did, in 1999. Okay. And eventually you became chairman of the firm. Yes. What does that mean? So chairman, president, managing partner, all kind of synonymous. So I was, you know, essentially the chief executive officer of, uh, of the firm. And we had... F- Several years before that, it kind of moved to a more corporate model of governance within the law firm. Law firm, you know, like an accounting firm, like a consulting firm, it's a professional services organization. So the way those organizations govern themselves is different from a Fortune 500 company or other large organizations. So we had, at that point, 80 lawyers and then staff. So we probably had 200, 250 employees. So not a not a not a small business by any stretch. And you know, as we were getting bigger and more offices, we, you know, you need professional management and somebody who wakes up every day worrying about the direction of the firm, the strategy, and um, so uh, so we changed the way we so we put the we put the we had a a president of the firm and, and that would have more, more power than a typical managing partner. A lot of law firms govern themselves like a Kiwanis club, as I describe <laughs> it. You know, okay. you, you're the managing partner for a couple of years and, and then the next guy comes in uh-huh. and you don't have a lot of power and it's all done by consensus. Sort of and first among equals kind of. Pretty much. And so we, we changed to, to have a stronger chief executive but it's a different kind of leadership than, than in a big organization because you're still, you, you still have a practice. You still, I didn't do that job full time. I didn't give up my practice. Okay. Because I knew someday I was going to, I would you know, likely go back to my practice. And you spend a lot of your time as the president of a law firm telling people no. And so you, you don't make a lot of friends. You're determining people's compensation, so you yeah. definitely don't make a lot of friends. And yeah. one of our former senior partners who went on to serve on the uh, federal bench for many years, just a, a lion of the New Hampshire bar, said to me after about a year, he says, so how do you like the job as you know, president of the law firm? And I'm trying to put a good spin on it. It's great. It's Fantastic, very engaging, love it. He's like, don't lie to me. <laughs> he said, it's like being the only fire hydrant in a 50 dog town. I said, yeah. I said, all right. Well, that's kind of that describes some days. Yeah. So it's a it's a different kind of job. Yeah. But fun because you get to, you know, you, you know, I wanted to do. I was younger than. I was younger than, uh, most, when I, when I was elected as president and. You know, in hindsight, it was great. In other ways, it was, you know, not great because that's job typically you want for somebody that's kind of on the tail end of their practice and as opposed to somebody that's kind of on their way up because yeah. you're taking that person kind of out of 
generating out of that yeah the kind of the full-time generation of business and so we just demographically and generationally in the firm just didn't have like a big bench of folks that you know really senior folks there's a lot of those folks they either retired early or they became judges and so they had left the firm and so so i was at the time i think it was 40 years old 41 years old when i when i took on that job but i had you know, I had strong opinions about the direction of the firm and felt passionate, loved the firm, loved the people, loved the history, the legacy of the firm, and wanted to see it succeed. And so decided to put my money where my mouth was and, and, and took on the job. Nice. Yeah. What do people most commonly misunderstand or have misimpressions about around the practice of law? So like you're at a cocktail party with your wife, and you're chatting, and you say, and somebody says, well, what, "What do you do? Not now, but, yeah. but back then, you know, yeah. oh, I'm a lawyer. What a, what do you usually? What what goes in their head that's wrong? Oh gosh, lots. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like common misconceptions. You know that if you're a lawyer, you know everything about every area of law. This is like <laughs> doctors, right? Yeah. So if you're a, if you're if you're a if you're a uh, if you're a cardiologist, that but you obviously must know something about being a, being an epidemiologist or being a pulmonologist, or you can answer any question right. anybody has. I've under got the this sun. rash. Exactly. <laughs> what do you think? And same thing with practicing law. So if you're yeah. a lawyer, you know it doesn't. So you know you have people. So what about you know? Um, I got this neighbor, or you know, I got this problem. You know, my 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 uh, my brother's getting divorced, and you know, what about this thing on alimony? And people make those assumptions that you know everything. And you know, the practice of medicine, like the practice of law, has changed pretty dramatically, and it's become super specialized. And so, your general practice lawyers, the people that kind of probably. You saw in the movies, you know, that, you know, solo practitioners that can live in town and do anything, um, you know, those are kind of a thing of the past. And same same with practicing medicine. Yeah. Um, it's become so specialized that there's no such thing as a general surgeon anymore, right? Or, People are coming out of law school and out of fellowships with a, with a, with a specialty. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, I would say, a big... And then I, the other thing, I think people, when people think about lawyers that try cases for a living, that you know, you're constantly in court. You spend most of your life writing briefs. I read somewhere once that the average, the average litigator writes more than the average novelist. And that you just constantly, motions, letters, briefs. It's just so if you don't like to write, you should not be a litigator because much of what you don't, you only get to communicate verbally a small percentage of the time. Most of the time you're advocating on behalf of your client through written word. Wow. Okay. So in 2012, you left Divine and Millman, came here to CMC, yes. to Catholic Medical Center. Yes. Were you, at that point in time, were you still the president of the firm? I was, but okay. my, I was wrapping up my second term as president of the firm so and we had a an unwritten rule that it was people were going to do two terms and then go back to you know full-time practice so as i was as i was wrapping up thinking about what was next i had uh, catholic medical center had remained a client so uh, there's, we had a team at the at the firm that that worked on the Catholic Medical Center account over the years, and so and I had from time to time helped them with different litigated matters, and loved the organization and the people and the mission, and so I was probably a year away from wrapping up my second term as president of Divine Millimat and received some inquiries from. CMC about, you know, maybe coming on board as their first general counsel. So the hospital didn't have inside, in-house general counsel like a lot of healthcare organizations do. But times were changing and they were deciding, you know, we probably need to have somebody on the inside. So we started to have that conversation. And um, I had made a commitment to the firm 
through the end of that second term. So kind of deferred. And then as the time drew nearer and I was thinking about, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to stay at the firm and go back to the full-time practice? Yeah, I'd been at the firm at that point 20 years and loved it, uh, still loved it. But I was kind of ready for something different, for a different kind of challenge. And like I said, I loved the the work that CMC did. I loved the spot that it occupied here in the city and the state. I saw where it had been, and it was kind of coming through a bit of a rocky period and thought I had some skills that could help kind of put it back on, on the right track. So thought long and hard about it, talked to some trusted friends and, uh, and my wife and said, you know, in the end, what's the worst that can happen, right? right? You right. know, I mean, they can shave my head and send me to Okinawa, right? That was an old Marine Corps saying, like, what's the worst they can do? They'll shave your head, they'll send you to Okinawa. I said, all right, so let's let's give it a shot. That's a that's a huge change, right? I mean, you're yes. leaving, leaving a, a, a law practice to now be kind of a one, a shop of uh, one. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's it's like a lot of things in life you're like, you look back and you say, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, that was like a borderline kind reckless of like when you're decision. Kind of like the Marines? Or like, yeah, uh, you know, and but, but, you know, it's one thing uh, when you're 17. Right. I mean, here I was. <laughs> I was. I mean, you yeah. know, I'm in my... I'm in my mid 40s and uh, the late 40s at that point. Gosh, uh, 48 and two kids, wife, mortgage, looking down the barrel of college, and you know. But it's like I don't know if you're gonna. You kind of at some point in life, you know, you just kind of bet on yourself. Mm-hmm. They're like, this is gonna work. How is this not gonna work? And and what and like literally, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, is it a big career decision? Sure it is. Is it scary? No question. Yeah. But you think about, I mean, it's invigorating. Yeah. The change and, and the new the new challenge weighed against the prospect of doing the same thing for the next 20 years that I had done for the previous 20. You know, that just didn't have the same, I just didn't get the juices flowing the same way. So. So you made the jump. Made the jump. Yeah. So um, a little bit about CMC. Yeah. I know I've, I've had, as we talked about, I've had Dr. Pepe, the president, on right, in, pe- sure. in the past. But yeah. for folks who haven't actually listened to that, yeah. give, give me the, give us the kind of quick, yeah, a little bit about CMC, history, size. Yeah, um, so sure. So CMC is a community hospital, you know, among 13 community hospitals in the, in the state. There are 13 critical access hospitals in the state, so a total of 26 in the pantheon of community hospitals I, you know we are among the largest not quite the largest so Dartmouth Hitchcock an academic medical center is you know the biggest in the state and then depending on how, how you count you know whether it's net patient service revenue or number of licensed beds you know CMC is among the largest in the state and we have 330 licensed beds we do about f- between 450 and 500 million dollars a year and net patient service revenue. So, you know, CMC, Elliott, Concord Hospital, all kind of in that, you know, we are among the largest of the community hospitals in the state. And we're a Catholic organization, so it means that we ultimately report to the Bishop of Manchester, uh, who holds considerable reserve powers over the organization, things like, you know, the selection of people that sit on our board of trustees and in hiring and firing of our chief executive officer. So the bishop is a, is a strong presence here that is ultimately um, oversees our Catholic identity and our Catholic mission and is very engaged, has a, has a delegate that sits on our board of trustees, the bishop's delegate for health care. Um, so that's, and we are one of two Catholic hospitals in the state of New Hampshire, the other being St. Joseph's in Nashua. And, but we're different kind of Catholic organizations. Our reporting structure is different, which is a little okay. uh, strange for, for people to understand. So in the, in the Catholic world, you're, you either report to the local bishop or to Rome 
and and so the, the, the term public juridic person, so so we are a public juridic person of a diocesan right means that we report to the local bishop. Where Saint Joe's is a public juridic person of pontifical right, so they report to Rome. Oh well, okay. And um, are they associated with a what is the word I'm looking for? Denomina- uh, not denomination, but um, uh, like are they Jesuit? Uh, that's yeah, what I'm so for. Dominican, they, uh, Jesuit. No, that's a good question. So I think they Is go back they go? to kind of the gray nuns and okay. and and at St. Joe's and and over time, so they are now part of a larger health system called Covenant Health System. Okay. And so it's comprised of St. Joseph's two hospitals in Maine, smaller community hospitals, and a number of nursing homes in Massachusetts and Maine um, make up the Covenant system. Interesting. Okay. CMC is part of the Granite One Health system. So we formed right. Granite One Health, or we became a member of Granite One Health uh, several years ago, along with Monadnock Community Hospital in Peterborough and Huggins Hospital up in Wolfboro. So uh, that Granite One is comprised of you know CMC, Huggins, and Monadnock. And so CMC has been around since... 1974 was the kind of the merger of Sacred Heart and Notre Dame hospitals here in the city, but been here on the west side uh, for a very long time. Yeah, and we have we're a heart hospital in a lot of ways. It's our flagship. We have a top 50 in the nation heart and vascular program. It is just a gem of really world class doctors and and mid-levels and nurses and probably have 70, 75 providers within the Heart and Vascular Institute that are employed by CMC. And it's just a, it's just a, a great, great program. So you came on as general counsel. I did. Um, uh, but that's not the role you're in now. So right. tell me a little bit about kind of your transition to coming yeah. from general counsel up to being the chief operating officer and executive vice yeah. president. What was the... So, so it's kind of, so I've been here now uh, a little over seven years. And so my uh, my first day at CMC um, was also the first day for Dr. Pepe. Okay. Who became the interim CEO. And so his office, as we see there, was right next door to mine and so we both showed up on that first day with our little cardboard boxes and really hadn't worked very closely together. Joe didn't hire me and so but he became the interim and I was the new general counsel and we said on day one this is either going to be a crash and burn (laughs) failure or you know it's the beginning of a, a journey that will be a lot of fun and a lot of hard work and so my role, because I, I was a, the first general counsel that the organization had, uh, but not a healthcare lawyer. Right. So, and I, that was the deal coming in. I, you know, I let folks that, you know, I have some skills and some things that I think I can be helpful with, but if you're looking for somebody that can talk to you about 340B programs and Stark and I kick back in a nuanced way and, um, all the things that healthcare lawyers know and do and understand, that's not me. And so, and that's, that's not what the organization was, uh, was needing at the time and have lots of folks that we work with that can provide, you know, those specialized services. But helping to quarterback all of that and helping to renew and restore relationships throughout the state is something that, I had some experience with at the law firm and uh, and on behalf of other clients, so I knew my way around the state house and um, so relationship building was a part of what CMC needed at that time. Um, reestablishing relationships within the business community is something that we needed at that time, and I had you know been involved with the business and industry association, having served on that board and chairman of the board of directors for the Manchester Chamber of Commerce, chaired the board of the uh, United Way. And so I had been very involved in the community for a number of years and loved that part of what I did at the firm and thought that any organization of this size in this state, you know, really needs to have deep commitment to the community. And um, so that, you know, that's part of what I brought as well. And so the job over time kind of evolved. And as you know, Dr. Pepe was made the permanent CEO 
about six months after that. And we had uh, went some period of transition with the leadership team. And so uh, had made some decisions and some folks transitioned. And, and my role became more based on the strategic development of the organization. So mm-hmm. I became a senior vice president for uh, strategic development and helped to lead our growth effort over the next uh, several years, you know, in terms of, you know, our relationships with other hospitals around the state and our hub and spoke model for Mm -hmm. heart and vascular services. And we developed a transfer center to help small critical access hospitals with patients that needed a higher level of care, you know, make that process uh, more efficient. So we opened a transfer center. Thinking about how to grow uh, in different areas around the state, how to grow here in Manchester. So those are all the things that I was becoming more and more involved in, which I loved. And then probably two years ago, just um, kind of evolved a little bit more. And so we needed to have a little more focus on kind of internal things going on here. So I became chief operating officer. So my role today is... It uh, has an internal focus and an external focus, but we have a great team that, you know, support everything we do and both on the operations side here at the hospital and, you know, the things that we're, that we're doing around the state. So, so tell me a little uh, – from an internal focus, what, what, does, what does the chief operating officer yeah. oversee on a data – like what are you looking at on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we, you know, right now our focus is on – patient flow and length of stay and improving our facility and increasing access for patients. You know, we this year we built a uh, 10-bed observation unit next to our emergency department for, we call it a, a clinical decision unit for patients that need some level of observation before we send them up to an inpatient floor. We built a new 10 bed ICU so that so we now have 30 ICU beds here at CMC which is pretty unheard of for a community hospital but because we provide such a we see the sickest patients in the state because of our heart and vascular program and so you know having 30 ICU beds is a necessity but we have an old physical plant and so part of my job is to help oversee kind of keeping the the physical plan up and running and to yeah. think about growth opportunities and how we're going to increase the number of beds that we have. How are we going to increase the size of our emergency department? How are we going to, you know, increase the size of our heart and vascular unit? So we're right in the middle of a lot of that right now to grow, build the campus, and we're doing some master facilities planning around that. So that's a big part of what I've done over the last year or two is just, you know, we've had a number of projects around here that to help update the facility and help in, improve, you know, patient flow and then patient experience. So that's a that's a big piece of what I do. I also oversee our communications and marketing and number of uh, operational units, you know, within within the hospital. But have a terrific senior VP of operations that we brought on a couple of years ago, and she she and I work very closely together on on a whole bunch of different things within the hospital. So um, one of the things you mentioned I wanted to ask about was uh, Granite One. And kind of that's that was big news a couple yes. years ago when yes. you formed that system. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I've, as we were chatting before, you know, I got here in 2015 and it seems like everybody is everybody's linking up, uh, linking up in, yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. I mean, there's only a handful of folks left that are folks, a handful of facilities that are still yes. kind of standalone. That's true. Um, what was the motivation behind forming Granite One? So we, you know, as we looked around the state and um, understood kind of the direction that healthcare, you know, was going, getting better, uh, getting bigger and better, and increasing your scale, solidifying relationships with organizations that you've been partners with for a number of years was all very important. And so coming together in a more integrated way was very important for us with some of our partner hospitals in Huggins and Monadnock. Had, you know, we have been working together with them for 
20 plus years. And so they are critical access hospitals in rural parts of the state. Rural hospitals have challenges that are unique. And so they need things that larger organizations can offer. And so, you know, we decided to come together in a, in a more integrated way. And so that was really the, the impetus behind Grain of One. What kind of things does a, w- would Monadnock and, and Huggins get from partnering with and affiliating with CMC? So mostly access to specialty services, including... You know, obviously heart and vascular, but orthopedics, some of our resources in back office functions, risk and compliance and access to it's a deeper bench of people. You know, the critical access hospitals run lean and mean and right. really don't have a lot of depth on the bench. And so having uh, a partner that you can lean on for either services or even if it's just best practices and ideas. So that's really was the thinking behind coming together. And not, it wasn't, you know, we didn't view it as an acquisition or takeover or any of that. It was a way for us to, to be more integrated and closer with some of our closest partners. And with the idea that over time, you know, we would come together in a, and hopefully grow and not grow for the sake of growing, but you know, grow in a smart way okay. to to be able to deliver better care, more efficient care, lower cost care. And so that really has been what's informed our thinking around uh, around Granite One initially and then, you know, our current growth plans. Yeah. So at the Granite One level, are there, are there services that are being kind of consolidated so that you can, you mentioned like risk, for example. Yeah. Are are you centralizing certain functions? Yeah, so we've uh, so we'll use we'll use risk and 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 corporate compliance as a good, as a good example. So we're you know two years into Granite One, and we've been you know working on a pretty robust integration plan to really uh, not necessarily consolidate services, but you know to assess current state you know, what the needs are to build some strategies around how we're going to uh, to be helpful and in some instances to, to, to move towards, you know, consolidation. And so, you know, with compliance and risk, you know, we put a plan in place to um, really kind of have um, some standardization of how the compliance function works at, at all three organizations to provide help to Huggins and Monadnock uh, in the area of compliance. We have an unbelievable director of corporate compliance, and she is a total rock star. And she, uh, she probably the, she did unquestionably the best in the state. And so, you know, being able to have her help, you know, these organizations with the compliance function is just you can't be just you can't put a price on that mm-hmm. uh, just because of because you just don't know how much trouble she's able to keep you out of right 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 and right. so that but that's a that's a really good example of how to uh, and you do that in a way that you know nobody's you know nobody's getting laid off nobody's losing a job you're not consolidating for the sake of shedding bodies you're consolidating and cooperating and um, coordinating in a way that just makes the that function much better at each organization. So, anyway, as I mentioned, I mean, the healthcare landscape is changing so fast, and uh, you know, not just in New Hampshire, of course, yeah. but all over the all over the country. Um, we were seeing a lot of this affiliation behavior uh, with with uh, organizations pursuing exactly the kind of mm-hmm. efficiencies you were just talking about. What do you see going forward in the future? Uh, do you see more of that? Do you see kind of? Uh, I mean, you you so. Catholic Medical Center has just announced a, a, an intention to affiliate with Dartmouth. Yes, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, which you know, you've you've alluded to. Yeah. So, what are the gains to be had there, and how does that fit in with kind of the bigger, your bigger strategic vision of where where? Yeah, health, uh, it's a, I, you know it's a very exciting announcement. It's a you know combination of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, which is the uh, another, the, the parent entity 
of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical okay, Center right. and a number of critical access hospitals, uh, and Granite One Health, and so with Catholic Medical Center and Huggins and Monadnock. So those two systems combining to form Dartmouth Hitchcock Health Granite One, and so right. that will be a new entity with a with a uh, fifteen person board, and and that will serve as the sole member of all of the. Uh, present entities affiliated with Dartmouth and Granite One. And for CMC, the bishop will still have uh, a co-membership role like it does with Granite One. So, you know, for us, we we didn't, we wouldn't get into Granite One. We don't do any, uh, any we don't engage in any st- strategic growth that will in any way diminish our Catholic identity, dilute it in any way. And so for us, you know, our mission, our Catholic identity are, are paramount. And so um, we've been able to put together a corporate and governance structure, we think, that, that will maintain that Catholic identity for us. The bishop has uh, been engaged in the process along with our Catholic ethicists. So uh, we're hopeful that it's going to come together in a way that will allow us jointly to, you know, increase access to healthcare for patients all over the state, reinforce rural health. You know, we, CMC and Dartmouth, you know, have, and Granite, well, you said Granite One and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, you know, have a number of critical access hospitals, you know, within those systems. And so and there's really no other systems in the state that support rural healthcare the way we do. And you look around and what's happening with Everybody else is picking a dance partner, right? Right, And right. so you've got HCA, you know, a $54 billion for-profit organization, the largest hospital operator in the, in, the, in the nation, you know, is on the verge of owning three hospitals in New Hampshire. Right. Uh, partners and Mass General acquired Wentworth Douglas several years ago and now have plans for Exeter. So that's a partners is a $13 billion organization. They're going to build 450 beds private rooms down at, at Mass General Campus in Boston, and they're looking to have more and more patients from New Hampshire leave the state to have health care provided down there. And that's, you know, the overwhelming majority of those patients that leave the state every year, about 10,000 of them, could, you know, could and should have their health care right here in the state. They're not going down there for procedures that hospitals in New Hampshire can't perform. And so... That's, you know, when you talk about lowering the cost of health care, mm-hmm. you, you know, you think about whether or not, you know, getting that care, what, let's just say it's a, let's just say it's a knee replacement. You know, why would you go to an academic medical center? Right. right? That's pretty bread and butter. To get, yeah, exactly. And same with, you know, there's lots of procedures that, and there are procedures that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be doing at CMC. Uh, either because we don't know how to do them, we don't do them, or they're better off done in a in a in a much lower cost environment, like a like an ambulatory surgical center, and so which is we have we've had an affiliation joint ownership with the Bedford Ambulatory Surgical Center for twenty years now, but and that's how people lower the cost of healthcare. Go get your MRI at a place like Basque Imaging for five hundred bucks or six hundred bucks, as opposed to having it done in a hospital where it's going to be three, four, five times that. Right. Yeah. So those are all the things that go into why hospitals and hospital systems are coming together. And it's definitely why Dartmouth Hitchcock Health and Granite One decided to come together. Really a New Hampshire-based solution to uh, improving access and improving quality and, and really reinforcing rural health care in the state. That's very exciting. So I wanted to kind of conclude our discussion yeah. with a, a little bit about leadership. Mm. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is your leadership philosophy? Could you say it in a sentence or two? Uh, so I would say my, my leadership philosophy is um, you try to lead by example uh, because, you know, when you're a leader, people pay attention. You know, they pay attention to how you conduct yourself your bearing, your demeanor, how you how you solve problems, your temperament, and so setting a good example for people is, you know, I think a, a just a, a real hallmark of, of of good leadership. And understanding core values, 
and the mission of your organization, regardless of whether you're a not-for-profit healthcare organization or your law firm or uh, whatever your business, you know, you should have a set of core values that help kind of define who the organization is. And, you know, being the steward of those core values is the job of, of, any, of any leader. Yeah. How has your leadership style changed coming from a law firm to a hospital? Uh, that's a great question. Or has, um, it, or has it been the same? Well, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I think it's been the same. You know, as I get older, I hopefully get a little more patient. Mm. I think, you know, it, coming from a law firm, and I, 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 one of the things that really blew me away when I came here, um, I knew the organization, I knew a lot of the people, I knew what it did, but I underestimated the power of working for a mission-driven organization. You know, my law firm was a hard-charging, type A. We were there to, to practice law at a very high level and to make money. Yeah. And, you know, we did a pretty good job at both of those things. And, um, but coming here, it just, it's a different mindset. And, and like, just like for me, it's just so, so engaging and so important. And so that, and how does that, like, how does that reflect any change in leadership? I think it really does force you to double down on understanding and recognizing and living the core values and the mission of the organization. And so everything we do, you know, you do it with that kind of those core values and mission in mind. And, yeah. you know, there are days you don't live up to that standard, and, and, and but I would say most we do. And, and I think it's and being an ambassador for that is a part of you know any leader's job and so i think we do a pretty good job of that here where did you learn your leadership style i mean we've talked about the marine corps we've talked about yeah know, law firm i think you know i think uh you learn hopefully you learn leadership just along the way as part of your own personal journey and for me it started with people that you look up to as you're when you're growing up right your parents your siblings, your friends, your neighbors, people that you work for, teachers. And, you know, I've always tried and whatever I do to kind of take the best of what I see around me um, and try to incorporate that into, you know, my own, uh, my own leadership style, the way I practice law, the way you know, I do my job, you know, here as chief operating officer. You just want to take the best of what people can offer and incorporate that into your own portfolio and, and also understand kind of the worst of what's out there mm -hmm. and avoid doing that. Yeah. Um, but I would say, you know, the Marine Corps obviously shaped, uh, that was a big part of kind of my transformation as a person. And a lot of those qualities are just so transferable uh, today. But along the way, just, you know, working with really uh, smart, uh, capable people within the law firm, and I've had the good fortune of serving on a number of not-for-profit uh, boards. And so seeing leaders throughout the community has been a really great way to kind of, again, incorporate the best of what others have to offer. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Especially, I imagine, I mean, you, you went through the military, uh, you were in the military for a few years, but you spent 20 years at a, a law firm where mm -hmm. I assume that it's sort of like the military that people come for a few years and maybe say, you know, this isn't this isn't the right place for me, and I'm yeah. going to move to a different kind of yeah. environment. Mm. Uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm. I, is that accurate? Is that an accurate description of kind of how a, a partnership kind of for, firm sure. operates? People, yeah. you know, I'm not going to make partner. Maybe it's time for me to move on. Absolutely, yeah. People, uh, you know, you have people that come in and they're there for six months. They're there for six years and everywhere in between. And. Yeah. So yeah. I guess my, my question coming off that is, and, and maybe also your observation here, Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm thinking of the, the law firm in particular because you probably have a cycle of, of young people coming in each, sure. each year. What have you seen with you know, young, younger leaders? Where do they go wrong? Do you, is, there, is there a place where people who are making that transition to leadership, where have you seen them make mistakes? Is yeah. there, are there any patterns? I would say it's a really good question. I think when you're younger, it's and I, you know, I I, I had that. I think back on some of my you know, leadership 
failures, right? Some things, some lessons I learned and yeah. some things, you know, kind of with some, try to be self-aware. And sometimes it's hard, right? To like really take a critical look at something. And, but, you know, I think just being young, being like young people sometimes think they have the right path in mind and you're kind of bullish about pursuing it. You're not open to some alternatives and you're maybe think back on something that uh, I did as a young leader and wanted to get something done and didn't listen to some of the older folks that were saying, hey, you may want to try something different here. You may want to not force this issue right now. Give it a little time to resonate. Yeah. And 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 I'm you know, like, no, oh, the hell with that. No, this was my idea. It's a good idea. And if you don't like it, too bad. And so... You know, I brought it up and it got shot down and it was painful and it was, but it was a great lesson for like just taking the long view on things, right? It's not, everything's not short term. You have to take the long view. You may not win the battle, but you, you know, you can still win the war, right? The old saying. And so just uh, being a little more strategic and thinking like Larry Bird, like three plays ahead, Right, he was a great strategic ball player. All the best players, you know, they think several plays down the field, and so you do that in business too, right? You want to you want to pick your spots, and I think younger folks sometimes don't have that long term goal in mind, whether it's in their own individual careers or it's in leadership positions they hold in organizations. You've talked a little bit about mission driven culture. Mm-hmm. What is organizational culture and kind of how do you, how, how does an organization nurture it? How do you in particular think about that and how yeah. do you try to influence that? Yeah. You know, thinking back to either your law firm or here at CMC or both. Yeah, boy. So for here, you know, when you're a not-for-profit, every, every not-for-profit has a mission, right? And some not-for-profits, you know, have a mission and it sits up on a shelf collecting dust. All organizations should have you know, a set of core values and you either live them every day and you talk about them or you don't. And for us, you know, our mission of, you know, health, healing and hope, you know, that's a big part of what we do every day. And so when, and we talk about it, the, our board of trustees reaffirms that mission every year. We talk about our mission and helps guide kind of the things that we're doing. Same with, you know, our values, you know, respect and dignity and um, patient-centered care. And, you know, there, there are times along the way when, you know, you have people or issues that don't jive with that. And not, it's not to say we're right and they're wrong. It's just, it's just a misalignment of, of, of values. And so it's just a great way to keep your eyes on the prize and yeah. and keep the organization moving forward. But I think talking about it is is a way the best way to make sure that we all kind of live it every day. So talking about it amongst your peers, amongst, amongst your- our peers, we talk about it in our you know, our managers and directors meetings every month, our senior leadership, I said at the board level, I think in staff meetings, it's just and, you know, and then you're able to say, you know, you have these mission moments where you say, pick out a story, pick out a thing that one of our employees did or a patient that had something to say about our mission. And, and you just kind of, you want to you wanna talk about it, you want to celebrate it, you want to understand it when you don't live up to the, to the expectation and be honest about why you didn't and try to make sure that that doesn't happen again and but having it at the at the forefront of your thinking is uh, the best way to make sure that you know you're living up to that promise. How important were mentors to you coming up? Did you have mentors that really influenced you? Yeah, so you? huge. Yeah, yeah, I mean, really huge. Uh, and I just I think having people to look up to, having people to draw inspiration from, to provide guidance. Uh, I mean, I look back at every step of high school journalism teacher to folks that I looked up to when I was in the Marine Corps to professors I had in college to partners that 
had in the law firm. I mean, every step of the way, you know, mentors are, and today, to this day, you want to have people that you can talk to and run ideas past and help solve problems. So it's a, uh, I think it is, it's a huge part of anybody's, should be a huge part of anybody's journey. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work with younger folks today, younger junior leaders today? Yeah, I try As to. A- it's hard. I don't have any, uh, I don't have a, f- like, not part of a formalized okay. mentor system, but I love, you know, I'm, I, I try to be as accessible as I can. So if somebody wants to have, you know, a cup of coffee and talk about, make a connection, I'm, I'll, I'll do that. I mean, I'll make time for that. That's really important. Uh, people here in the organization that, you know, want to serve on boards and want to get connected to something in the community, I want to be helpful with that, just problem solving with the folks that report to me, helping them develop professionally, talk openly about like what's what's next? What do you want to do next? What do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? How do we help you get there? Those are the kinds of things. It's exciting. And as you get older, it's, it's fun. Like a fun part for me is, you know, you've been around a long time and you know some people. And so making connections for people is fun. Kind of whether it's just for personal development or business, it's like just kind of helping to put pieces together is uh, is, a, is a fun part of what I do. Uh, but it's yeah, mentorship is uh, it's 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 huge, and young people underestimate the power of of good mentorship at their peril. Yeah, yeah. So uh, last question. Uh, so you know, I, I teach at, at UNH. I mm-hmm. have uh, uh, we were talking before we started. You know, mostly undergrads. Yeah. Who are uh, looking at a career in healthcare administration? Yeah. What advice would you give a young person, 22 year old, just getting ready to launch into into healthcare? Where should they go? What should they look at? What yeah, kind of I would say, like, congratulations, you've picked a an industry, an area, a profession that is in the middle of, like, really generational, maybe once in a lifetime transformation. And so, like, if you're a glasses half full kind of person, and it is like the opportunity is just unbelievable. And so the things that you that you can be involved in, the things you can do, the upside potential is fantastic. And so you're going to live, you're going to be involved in a very engaging, dynamic profession. If, if you're risk averse... And if it, it, it's not for the faint of heart. And so if your glasses have empty kind of person and it, 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 it can be a daunting profession yeah. and, and industry because it's changing so dramatically. And so I would just say if, if you're a young person, think about think about where you want to live. Right? I mean, because there's so much opportunity. You know, you decide some professions, you have to go where the jobs are. In healthcare, the jobs are everywhere. So pick a fun place to live, <laughs> right? Where right. you want to raise a family and yeah. start there. Yeah. And you know, once you kind of put that pin on the map, look at, look at what's around. I mean, you can do, you can go to small operations, you can go to not-for-profits, for-profit, big health systems, small providers. All of the, you know, lots of disruptors out there in healthcare. There's just so much opportunity. And I would just say, you know, get as much of that as you can. Find some good mentors along the way. And it's just, there's just endless opportunity. And you can reinvent yourself along the way, right? I mean, I've done Case that, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So life is long. That's, a, that's another. <laughs> uh, life is long. So don't sweat short-term disappointments or failures, right? Just keep your eye. It's a long life. Things will change. It's always better tomorrow, right? With a good night's sleep comes like a different perspective. And if you're at the end of your career, finish strong. I mean, we should all, no matter what you're doing, you need to finish strong. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, this was a lot of fun. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, 
Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.